Well, it's uh, my absolute pleasure to have the uh, privilege and the opportunity to, I don't really think it's going to be a conversation, I hope that you do uh, most of the talking. Um, and uh, we're delighted to have you here in Australia, and we thank uh, Amen on uh, the drawer. Thank you for having me, it's a pleasure. And in the time that we have, we want to cover a, a, a range of topics. Uh, let's sort of start from the external and then move internally. Uh, we see a lot of what's happening today, the number one issue at least that the Israeli government is raising is the, the situation in Lebanon and Syria, uh, Iran, the detente at least in Syria between uh, Putin and uh, Trump. What are your views on that? Well, actually, this is one of the, I think, most worrying issues that we have as far as security goes these days in Israel. And it's um, unfortunate that at a time where our government, and Prime Minister specifically, is in such good relationship with both the American um, president, whom many in our government and our coalition so as the next thing before the Messiah. Um, and, on the, and at the same time with uh, President of Russia, Putin, that Davka in these times, both presidents and both superpowers realizing that Putin is genius ingeniously managing to bring Russia to be on its way to a superpower once again, both of them are practically ignoring Israel's needs and interests regarding Iran and Syria and our northern frontier. We need to keep Iran away from our borders. This is not happening. All of the agreements that they have, formally and non-formally, allow Iran to be closer to our northern border than ever before, in a way that is really bothering. Now, of course, we have our army. We are a superpower ourselves. We are an extremely sophisticated and strong country. But the fact that we even have to deal with this threat is not only bothering in the security sense of it, but it bothers me what it means in terms of the relationship that we're supposed to have with both America and Russia. But even so, um, and everything you said is uh, quite clear, um, on the other hand, Amir Eshel, when he retired from the Air Force, he surprised, uh, at least uh, the rest of us, not by the fact that Israel's taking action in Syria, but the scale of that action that has taken place, and surely at least that can't happen without some understanding or agreement, particularly with Putin. I would prefer to not have to strike in Syria and have the Iranians further away from the border. Enough said. So keeping on that theme of the failed messiah, at least at this point in time uh, with President Trump, um, and moving to the issue that's been, uh, let's say, since Israel's establishment, but particularly acute since 67, is the two-state solution alive or dead? The two-state solution is not really an entity that breathes on its own. It only lives or dies according to what we decide to do with it. I strongly believe, and ever since I've been on the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee in the past four and a half years, because I've been there ever since I came to the Knesset, this was one of the most important things for me to be able to do. And also on the prominent subcommittees, I can tell you, more responsibly than ever, how possible it is, the two-state solution. How many options we still have to go about it and make it successfully happen in so many ways. Question is, and always has been, of political win on both sides. That's true. Both on the Palestinian side, but 
make no mistake, also on the Israeli side. And I am sadly saying that the only time that we had actual political will to work towards a solution, to really find a solution, not to play the blame game more effectively and to show that we have done everything and they're the evil ones. The only time that that happened was with Yitzhak Rabin and the Oslo Accord. Doesn't matter what you think of the Oslo Accord itself. But the political will to actually turn every stone on the way to peace, as Rabin put it, this is the only time it was done. Not El Barak, unfortunately, not El Dormant. None of these, and certainly not this government, which a larger part of it says loudly, not even with any attempt to hide it. Like um, Naftali Bennett said in the last negotiation, he said, let them negotiate, nothing will come out of it anyway. It's not a problem. So this is our main problem. Now, I, and I think this is the difference, the main difference maybe between what we call still right and left. And that is, and belonging to the center left, I am not busy with saying the Palestinians don't want, the Palestinians will not agree, or did not agree, or they had their chance, or whatever. Because I'm thinking of my interest. My interest as an Israeli, as a, especially as an Israeli leader, the interest of the state of Israel. Now I want to pick up exactly on what David, which really, Thank you for a most fascinating lecture before I was in the back listening. Where David left off speaking about who are we? Who is the state of Israel? What is our identity? And unfortunately, I have to tell you that it works both ways in terms of the conflict. On one hand, as long as we keep the conflict the way we've been handling it, knowing it, keeping it for the past 50 years. We will never be, we'll ne we will not have the energy, the space, the vacancy to figure out who we are. And at the same time, I will tell you that we are clinging to it because we are afraid to figure out who we are. Think about it. The State of Israel exists twice as long with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict since 67, that it has without it. In terms of identity, we do not recognize ourselves without the conflict. It totally defines us today. It makes, it gives us meaning. It gives us justification. It gives us something to throw everything on. In, if you think of the number of Israelis living, who did not know any other reality. I mean, I remember the state of Israel as a child, it was different. I mean, yes, it was after 67, but it took time for Israel to change. But more people were born to, to this reality, and moreover, many people were born. And, I mean, after the Oslo Accord, after the peace agreement with Jordan, and all they know is a history of failures to achieve peace, to achieve an agreement. They do not remember how inconceivable it was that we would sign a peace agreement with Egypt. How weird it was that we could sign a peace agreement with Jordan. And even the euphoria, and I don't know if you remember or if you were, um, if you were witnesses to the euphoria, nothing less, nothing short of euphoria that took place in Israel in the Oslo when, when it was signed. So, it's a matter of political will. If and when a prime minister in Israel comes to the Israelis and tells them, I brought you an incredibly good agreement. It will not be easy, it will not be simple, but it guarantees the safety of Israel, the security of Israel. It guarantees that Israel will be the Jewish state. Um, the Jewish state, the Jewish, that we can discuss that later when you come on the stage, but the homeland of the Jewish people, it will bring us prosperity. It is the best thing that we can do. 
the big, the, the vast majority of Israelis will support it in a heartbeat. I guess that what you're presenting is an ideal picture of an agreement and that uh, most people's response would be yes, but we've been mugged by reality on the way. And the, I guess there's doubt as whether that such an agreement could actually even be achieved. So how do you answer that question? You had the hit map could in 2000, the disengagement in 2005, you've had the rockets coming over. Each time that Israel has seemed to want to take a chance, a chance, a chance, the people seem to have been uh, rewarded by insecurity rather than security. The disengagement was exactly that. It was a disengagement, not an engagement. It was not an agreement. It was a refusal on Sharon's behalf, even though he was offered plenty of opportunities and ways to go about leaving Gaza with an agreement with the author Palestinian Authority. Many claim, and I tend to hear the logic in what they say, that had Sharon given Gaza to Abu Mazen, had he given him the keys in an agreement, then what happened in Gaza with Hamas taking over would have been much more difficult for them to make happen. It would have proven the Palestinians that there's something to work for. But that way what he supplied with them is this image of the Israelis just giving up, going out, getting out, getting out. Okay, we'll try to get them out from other places as well. On both sides, it created lack of trust, lack of security, and lack of further belief in the, in the future. I, I can say that because as much as I thought that we should get out of Gaza, I was against the disengagement in real time. You know, I'm so, um, so happy that five years prior to my coming to politics, I had the privilege of writing op-eds for Haaretz. It's like, it's as if I have an alibi for everything that I want to say now. It's like it's already written in real time, you can see the date. So, really the disengagement proves nothing. Proves nothing. If anything, it proves that we need an agreement. And that, once again, I can tell you responsibly, not only do we have a partner for an agreement, but we have multiple partners. Because we tend to forget or make go away, according to our interests, the Arab League Peace Initiative, which was presented to Israel already 15 years ago, in 2002. That was actually a huge white flag brought by the Arab League and later on also all of the Muslim countries that also affirmed it, saying, okay, we got it. You're not going anywhere, you're here. We are offering you full normalization with all of the Arab countries in return for a Palestinian state in the 67 borders. Since then they added the, the land swap. And, and agreed upon solution for Jerusalem and the refugees. Now, everyone knows there's not going to be any kind of right of return. Everybody knows that, including the Palestinians. But we never tried to really work it out. And we have all these Sunni countries, which, as David rightfully mentioned, Saudi Arabia, we do not, we're not accountable enough for the extent to which they are responsible to the Muslim education worldwide that generates also Al-Qaeda and uh, ISIS. Not, th these, of course, are not the only things that create Al-Qaeda and ISIS. Failed states and the failure to supply people with the essence of mere life is a big, big, big part of it. But Given all of that, Saudi Arabia, with other countries, are even more eager to have an agreement with Israel and to get the Palestinian thing over and out of the way than ever before. It's, a lot of it is up to us to just take it, to leverage it, to work it for our interest. So I guess a sort of an uncomfortable, less comfortable question you know, in Australia, we used to uh, take delight in laughing at the uh, political system in Israel and the instability and so on and so forth. And in the time that uh, Vivi's been Prime Minister of Israel, we've gone through six Prime Ministers in Australia, one of them twice. Um, he's outlasted Obama. Um, I mean, 
how do you explain then the message that you're trying to promote and yet through it all, Bibi seems to be, um, we don't know what's going to happen now in these uh, next few weeks in the, the legal issues, but uh, really unassailable and unchallengeable. And even if he does have opponents, they tend to come from within his own party rather than the opposition. You know what the tragedy of what you've just described? It's true, Netanyahu has been Prime Minister for nine years now, and there is zero stability in Israeli politics. Zero stability. He went... He's stable. He's, <laughs> even he's not, you know, that stable. Almost lost the last elections. But that's not what I mean. What I mean is that he went to elections twice before with the time that they were due. According to his political convenience, something which, once again, generates instability in the system, and does it now again. I mean, he wanted to go to elections a few months back when he created the crisis about the, I don't know if you were following, I feel silly to talk about it, but then again, um, when I rethink it, it's not silly at all. He created a huge crisis over the re-establishment of the um, public no, 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 the Kotel. <laughs> That's, yes, we can discuss the Kotel. No, but it was not even the Kotel. It was the, the public communication authority, the, the public broadcast authority. Um, it's a thing, in, in Israel by now it's a coin, Hatagid. Now, when you think of how closely, and, and we see this now with the legal, issues and the investigations of and what's happening with Israel today. Sheldon Edelson's newspaper working in Netanyahu's service, you I mean it's it's very obvious how much he regards the media in general. So but this crisis over the, the Ta'agid was yet an excuse to go to elections. He was faced with an unexpected opposition from his own party, and so it didn't happen. But there is no stability. And the problem is that the lack of this political stability prevents taking care of Israel's needs in terms of, as a country, the society in it. The ongoing for over a decade now, this housing crisis, which he as Prime Minister already promised to deal with so many times. Now, he's a, he's a very talented person. Nobody can take away from him. He's extremely smart, extremely capable. He could have done amazing things, but instead, this was not dealt with. The growing poverty in Israel is growing. The growing rift between the different parts of society, which to part of them, part of these rifts, he personally is responsible. But the others, he just allows. You mentioned the Kotel, for instance. Um, I would argue that one of Israel's great dangers, strategically thinking, is the fact that the only state in the world that does not recognize all kinds of Jews fully and equally is the state of Israel. How ironic, absurd, sad, and dangerous is this? So, yes, we have a problem of not being able to replace Netanyahu in the polls yet. But, you know how they say, Am ha-netzach lo mefached midirach haruka. And in this case, I would say, lo mefachedet. And really sort of the most the question we've been building up to really during this session, you know, if you don't know Australian Jewish leadership enough yet, you'll, or if you do, you know that we try to prove that really we control everything that happens in Israel. Um, so, and, so you should be doing a better job. Well, we, we, <laughs> Touche. But, but, we, but we are doing something because the new leader of the Labour Party, Avi Gabai, is a wife, Everywhere in the press, they say she's Australian, and they also write in your press. press that is in our press. In your no, press, in the Israeli oh, press, really? in the English-speaking oh, press, okay. they write, and Ayelet is a huge influence on her husband. And to the eternal shame of all of us here, nobody here knows who she is. So how Australian is she? 
I have no idea. <laughs> I've never met her. Um, Avi Gabay, as you know, our new chair, is new to the party. I've known him as a minister briefly, and I have never met his wife yet. But if this is such a huge issue, what time is it now in Israel? So they're already waking up, right? Can you please text Chaked to text Nati and to ask her what's Ayelet's maiden name? And how which city? Which city she was from? Because that's got like a big bearing on the city. Okay, well thanks for at least trying to resolve no, this issue. No, no, but by the end of our, okay. I'm not sure maybe not this discussion, but by the end of the panel with David, I promise you to have some answers. It gives, it gives a reason for people okay. not to leave the room. Yes. Yeah, no, <laughs> um, you know, moving from there to uh, internal issues, you're appearing on Q&A tomorrow night. And Q&A, which is our premier current affairs program on the ABC, has been promoting you because the big issue, the big issue in Australia today, there are no other issues except gender equality in marriage. That's the biggest issue. And they're leading with you saying that you are not in favour of gender equality in marriage. Long pause, because you're not in favour of marriage at all. <laughs> so the second part is true. <laughs> and the reason why they know that is that I uh, had, I made a TED talk seven years ago or something, entitled uh, Cancel Marriage as a legal institution, and I will explain in a minute why. But first and foremost, I will say that as far as my vision is to cancel marriage, and we do need to discuss this, ah, something that I did, okay. We need to discuss a lot of the numbers that you showed here, David, in terms of fertility. And you girls, you girls, how you do this, you girls. <laughs> I assure you, we will, dis we will be doing it less and less if you don't start changing the frameworks in which we are supposed to do that. But, as long as marriage is a civil institution, let alone marriage, um, religious, I do not get into religious issues as long as they're not um, as, they're, as long as they're not part of civil rights as long as marriage is something that gives civil rights status privileges duties etc it cannot be possibly in inaccessible to some inaccessible to some it's just impossible if you want to say we will not give out privileges and duties based on this institution, okay, this is not a problem. But if, as long as you are giving it out on this basis, it's not possible to discriminate some just because they prefer to sleep with other people. It's, you cannot justify it in any possible way. But, let's, but then again, I'm not voting here for this and I'm not sure I can convince you to change your vote. But let's talk about why marriage should be cancelled. Just for a second, okay? <laughs> um, I'm sure you're aware that marriage is not an invention of Judaism. I mean, as much as we have invented a lot, and Australian Jews have invented even more, <laughs> but it's as much... <laughs> uh, marriage has started long, long before the monotheistic religions. It started back in the days where humans first started realizing that they're dying and they wanted to leave something behind them to keep them alive after their death. Now, a woman, you know who's continuing her because someone actually came out of her and you know it's her flesh and blood and he or she are going to remain after her. Now, in a society, starting to realize that there is a connection between sexual relationship and reproduction, but where sex and relationship are not in any way registered or uh, disciplined in any way, how can a man know for a fact who's his own flesh and blood? Who will take his name, his property, and continue him after his death? So what men needed to do in order to have children who are as 
certainly is possible their own, and that to have legal custody over them. What they have is to have a womb which is written on their name. It's actually like a, when you register a house on your name. And to have it exclusive. So you, your sperm is the only one that is allowed to be in that womb, and so you are certain that the, whoever comes out of that is yours. This is the origin, this is the basis of marriage. It was designed to allow men, if you think the Jewish version of this, provu, okay? The commandment provu does not apply to women. You do realize that. Oh, the women in this in the room go, oh my God, yes, okay. It does not apply to women, only to men. But how will a man not only actually fulfill the commandment, but also show his public, his community, that he has a boy and a girl, and he has fulfilled polovu. So he needs a woman whom he is mekadesh, once, one, unilaterally, completely, because you know in the Jewish wedding, the woman doesn't say a word, not while she's not signing the ketubah, and not during the ceremony, often not later afterwards. Um, you're not being asked for anything. At mekudeshet, you're totally passive in the process, and what the man tells everyone is that from this moment on, you are allowed to him and forbidden for all the others. Now this is also why married women needs, need to cover their heads, their hair. Because hair is elvana only when you are married. If you are unmarried, you can, go, you can wear your hair freely, it's not a problem, it's not a modesty issue. But when you are married, you should be marked. So. Men, other men know that they should not covet you, because this is one of the major commandments, do not covet another woman's, another man's wife, of course. So you do not hurt his right to have his children from this woman that he made sure is written on his name. Now, with years, this has come with uh, this whole package of household, household works and child bringing. This whole section of, I don't know, 50, 70, depends who's counting, hours of wor worth of work that is not recognized in the economy. When, it is, when is it recognized? When you have to go to work yourself, and then all of a sudden, who's going to take care of your children exactly? Who's going to raise them for you? Who's going to clean the house, do the cooking, do the shopping, do the laundry, do whatever? This whole job, full-time job, that is not recognized in the economy to this day, 100 years after women are already, thankfully, recognized as autonomous in front of the law. Still, this minor issue is unresolved. And marriage is the basis, is the foundation, is the structure that allows the gender distinction, the gender inequality, and the inequality of women to not only continue, but to some extent even worsen with time. So we need what we really need to do, and we need to discuss the Jewish state. But I want you to consider the feminist state. Because the states all of us are living in, and that goes for France, and it goes for the US, are male states. Why? Because when the French wrote um, freedom, of, uh, fraternity, 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 yes. What they did, was, no, but, it, during the French Revolution, what they did was they just declared the general uh, voters. I don't know what the term in English is, the electorate. The electorate. The electorate. But in Hebrew, it sounds even better because it, it says the general electorate. And it excludes women. So the general electorate is men. And a few years later, when 
those nice English guys rebelled and went to the land of the free. They wrote their independence declaration, opening with the words, all men are created equal and free, meaning all white men with property are created equal and free. And thereby, we are drafting the ultimate document of democracy, the American Constitution, which just regulates the terms and conditions in which we, white men with property, can exchange all kinds of property, including women, children, men of other colors, doesn't matter which, what what time, and in what terms we can fight each other if we, the, the exchange doesn't go well. That's what it's all about, the laws, the basic structures that we are all living by and we are used to thinking of as forces of nature, the economy, the justice system, the states, civility. It's all laws made by men to arrange men's inner businesses. We need to rethink those structures because I don't want to turn around and say, okay, now for 500,000 years, we'll be on top. This is not what I want. It'll be as bad. Trust me. Because too much power ruins everyone. What I want is an economy that recognizes the worth of you want us to have babies? Give us and give yourselves, actually, tools to raise them. Men have to come into the house. A maternity leave has to be equal. It has to be maternity and fraternity leave. Same, same. It needs to be exactly the same to allow you men to uh, develop the hormones, those parental. We know today they're not maternal hormones. They're parental hormones. They are created in men's bodies exactly the same amount as they are in mothers when you take care of children, the physical care of children. By the way, that will cause a lot less wars. Well, I'm so, also, I'm, part of the thing. I'm so happy. I didn't think this was going to be the controversial question. I, was just, uh, I thought the two-state solution might... <laughs> Um, the second thing is, um, I think Australia... The two-state solution is so much easier. Yeah, and you guys, eventually you make peace, you know. But the then, let's change the work. The, the, second thing is, the second thing is, you liberated me because I didn't realize that's how marriages work. Wait till I get home. <laughs> um, and my wife and three daughters have convinced me it's a whole different system. Um, and the third thing is, and I think that... Australia was the first country in the world, if I'm not mistaken, to New Zealand. Women. New Zealand. New Zealand. New Zealand. It's, like, it's like we say New Zealand True. was the first here. It's also, <laughs> forget about it. New Zealand, you're right, but only married women in, women in the beginning. Oh, thank you. So and then Australia then was the first? Yes, but it, oh, that I'm not sure of. I'm sorry. But then, you know, only non-married non women, I'm sorry, only non unmarried women, because married women, you know, in Israel, when the state of Israel was in the process of being established, there was a big, big, big argument in the issue. Of course, the ultra-Orthodox didn't want women to vote. And then the first um, elections in Jerusalem, uh, women could not vote, but married men could vote twice. Honest to God. Okay. So, going back to Ami Ah, uh, No, I was oh, thinking of going back to ultra-Orthodox in Israel today. And, and I will say, first and foremost, that I think that the prophecy, first of all, you know demographic prophecies usually fail. You are aware of that. <laughs> but anyways, I think that the ultra-Orthodox community, I, I don't think I know, is changing so dramatically and rapidly. There's, there's so many processes that are taking part and going over this community these days, first of all, it's grown so huge that it's impossible to control it the way the rabbis were used to control it in the past. Secondly, they have media vessels, which they never had in the past. Technology. Sorry? Technology. Technology, no, but techno yes, it's not about what they have in their phones. They have formal, not only the newspapers that are like not connected to the world. But they have websites and they have radio stations, which I speak on regularly. I, as in people like me, as in leftists and women, 
talk of uh, leftists like and women. leftists and women both. Yes. No, it's the end of the world. I'm telling you. <laughs> so, and the rate of birth there will go and decrease. I'm sure of it. But what I want to talk about is their leadership that really gives. Of course, there's a backlash to all of this. Huge backlash. Part of it is the attempt to exclude women from public life, not only within the Orthodox and ultra Orthodox community, but also in public places, libraries, in um, whatever ceremonies or events that are being held in town halls and in places. Um, separation between women and men. By the way, part of the, the Kotel um, uh, fight is about that, of course. And in higher education, one of the biggest things that we're now fighting is the separation between men and women in higher education, not only in colleges now, but also in universities. Women are only um, forwarded to part of the schools and men to others. Women will not be allowed to come to campus on days that belong to men. Women will be um, held to a modesty standard in which if they don't meet, then they will be expelled. We see this effect. Men will not be taught by women. Doesn't matter how excellent and how um, prominent they are. They will not teach men. So this is something that we are dealing now in our public sphere in Israel, an extremely dramatic fight that we will have to win. Folks, we're out of time. Coming back to who are we? We're out of time. I think you can see that it's going to be a very important and dynamic visit. Watch Q&A tomorrow night. There's a debate this afternoon, uh, or a panel with David and uh, Merav. And please show your appreciation to Merav. And thank you all.